What have I learned from other mayors? I've learned that best practices don't come from a case study, from a, a class online. I can tell you we've learned the most from picking up the phone, calling each other when we have issues that affect us. Good afternoon, everyone. Ten years ago, City Lab began as a place for mayors to come together to share ideas. As a mayor, I was glad to be part of it. And our team at Bloomberg Philanthropies was glad to support it. Today, City Lab has grown into an event that brings together mayors, chief innovation officers, policy experts, and other local leaders from across the world to find answers to some of the most pressing challenges of our time. This is an example of subsidized housing in Vienna. This was designed by the tenants themselves. This is what we are reproducing whenever we have a chance to develop our city further. Fixing a city doesn't necessarily have to involve pushing out people who have been there for, for generations. Placekeeping is much different than placemaking. Placekeeping is about engaging the people that already live in a space and allowing them to preserve the stories, the culture. The Asphalt Art Initiative, we've helped make streets and sidewalks brighter, more visible, more full of life, and safer. Now Freetown is really densely populated, and that has been the driver for a lot of the challenges that we're now grappling with. I've been able to get some really practical solutions, whether it's with community engagement, whether it's the use of data. Transportation policy is delivered by the people who are doing the work day in, day out. And as we take equity more seriously as a transportation priority, I think it's just as important to ask the question, whose problems will this solve? We've got a London-wide low emission zone, which now covers pretty much any vehicle type except for cars. We've done a lot on air pollution, thanks in part to a very powerful lobby around air pollution. So London's much cleaner than a lot of other cities. Language skills considered advanced for her age, thanks to a novel program called Providence Talks. The principle behind this program actually turns out to be that a parent is a child's first and most important teacher. Digital innovation in Mexico City is a way to ensure that everyone in Mexico City have access to the rights they deserve. What I've learned from other mayors is that we have to talk to one another. We have to make sure that we're supporting one another so that we can be there and can be that strength in a time of real need. The horrific Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando killed 49 people. The message from the very beginning was, we're not going to be defined by the hateful act. We're going to be defined by a response. And that response has to be with love and compassion and unity. Extreme heat is our primary climate hazard. So we want all of these departments to follow a roadmap so that LA remains a habitable city. We've seen how important government is to keep people alive. Now is the vaccine rollout. When we come out on the other side of this thing, we're better, we're stronger, and we're more equitable. It's hard for me to say good morning because it's actually not a good morning in Ukraine. We have a mayor, he will need to leave today because his city was attacked. Thank you for support. We must believe in our victory. Never give up. On this 10th anniversary, we celebrate the role City Lab has played in helping local leaders become drivers of global change. And we are just getting started. Please welcome CEO of Bloomberg Philanthropies, Patty Harris. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to City Lab. I'm so glad to be here with all of you, and it's hard to believe that this is our 10th annual event, and we're so lucky to be here in the nation's capital city, Washington, D.C., to celebrate it. <clears throat> Special thanks to our amazing partners of the Aspen Institute, including President Dan Porterfield, my good friend, and thank you to everyone at Aspen for their great leadership. <laughs> we hosted the first City Lab in New York in 2013, back when Mike Bloomberg was mayor. 
And since then, we've taken it to cities around the world, from Los Angeles to Paris to Amsterdam just last year. Over the years, I'm proud that City Lab has become a must-attend event for the brightest leaders and thinkers to discuss solutions to the greatest challenges facing our cities. At Bloomberg Philanthropies, we're all, we've always believed in the power of bringing people together <clears throat> to share ideas, and that's what this week is about. And it's especially exciting to be here in this spectacular building, the new Johns Hopkins University Bloomberg Center, which is designed to convene leaders and scholars and students here in DC to grapple with global challenges and great opportunities. And a big shout out to President Ron Daniels, wherever you are, Ron, congratulations. <laughs> Mike is always pushing us to help break down silos and strengthen collaboration. And you can see it in the design of this great building and in the design of our conference, which really brings together thinkers from all around the world. So I think we're in for a terrific week, and I'm glad to say we have some great news to share that will help cities do more to exchange ideas. Mike wishes he could be here to tell you about it in person, but he didn't want to miss out on the opportunity. So before we get started, let's hear it from him. Thanks, Patty. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to our 10th annual City Lab. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you there today. After three and a half years, COVID finally got to me. I'm doing just fine, and I can't wait to hear the full report on how it went. Today, we're convening nearly 600 of the most creative and ambitious city leaders to wrestle with some of the most urgent questions facing the world. But we're also missing some incredible contributors to City Lab and our innovation community who had planned to be here with us, our Israeli contingent. Instead of joining us here, they're attending funerals for loved ones, searching for lost neighbors, housing those who've been displaced, lining up to give blood and helping however they can. We're as resolute in our rejection of the terror they have suffered as we were when terror struck in our own backyard on 9-11. And our Israeli colleagues will be with us in spirit as we gather here. As we kick off this great event, let me thank Johns Hopkins University President Ron Daniels for welcoming us to this brand new center. And also DC's dedicated and dynamic mayor, Muriel Bowser, for welcoming us to her city. It's fitting that we're hosting it in Washington, D.C., because mayors are natural bridge builders and their influence is growing in national capitals and on the global stage, too. Part of the reason for that is, over the last decade, mayors have been learning and borrowing good ideas from one another. And as a result, proven solutions to climate change, education, infrastructure, and much more have been spreading across the world, but not fast enough. And so today, our foundation is announcing a new first-of-its-kind effort called the Bloomberg Cities Idea Exchange. This exchange will create a central place for leaders to learn about proven ideas that already exist and also to receive technical resources and expertise to adapt the ideas to their local circumstances. It will offer startup grants for implementation, idea tours, as we call them, where local officials can visit other cities free of charge and see how innovations are taking off, and an evaluation fund where cities can submit promising ideas for further analysis to see if they can be replicated. An initiative of this scale has never been created before, but given the number of issues cities are facing, we couldn't be more excited about its potential to save and improve more lives. We hope everyone here will take full advantage of it and our team at Bloomberg Philanthropies is looking forward to supporting the work and seeing the results. And now it's my pleasure to introduce someone who really understands the importance of cities on the national and global stage. And that's because Mitch Landrieu has truly done it all. He was a state legislator, a lieutenant governor, a mayor, and now he works in the White House as a senior advisor. But as I like to say, once a mayor, always a mayor. Mitch is doing tremendous work ensuring that cities can get the infrastructure dollars they need to bring their ideas to life. So we're glad he could travel all the way down Pennsylvania Avenue 
to spend some time with us this morning. Mitch, the floor is yours. Hey everybody, good morning. good morning. It's nice to be here. Thank you, thank you, Mayor Mike. I appreciate that introduction from afar. I'm sorry that you can't be with us today, but I want to uh, begin by thanking him for his incredible leadership, one of the great mayors that America and even the world has seen in our time. Uh, and of course, yeah, you can do that. He can hear you, you know. Uh, and of course, to Johns Hopkins and, you know, to the entire group of folks that actually put this on it, to all the mayors. I'm looking out there to see all my friends. Uh, it's great to see all of you. Let me um, first tell you how happy I am to be here on behalf of the President of the United States. Um, he, as you know, is in Israel, uh, where he went to show his support after uh, the appalling terror attacks. And he's looking forward to hearing from Israel what they need to defend themselves against terrorists uh, and consulting uh, with them on the next step. I'm um, also to discuss with them the humanitarian crisis in Gaza uh, and the need to minimize uh, casualties. Uh, he is, as all of us are, outraged by the hospital explosion that uh, we saw uh, and believes that innocent Palestinians have nothing to do with Hamas, should not have access, should have access to food and water uh, and medical care, uh, and is developing a plan with Israel uh, so that we will enable humanitarian aid to reach civilians in Gaza in a way uh, that doesn't benefit Hamas. And as um, Michael said, we will hear from a number of mayors who were going to be with us today, uh, but could not be. Anyway, thank you all for being here today. I look out uh, amongst this crowd and I see folks that actually make it happen. Um, when the president was elected, uh, he had been many, many times um, to any event that he could be with mayors in it because he started off as a local elected official uh, he tells a, uh, a little story about when he was a United States senator getting called from one of his constituents to come over because they weren't picking the garbage up uh, and said, Senator, I need my garbage picked up. And he said, well, why didn't you call the mayor? And he goes, well, I didn't want to go that high. <laughs> so he understands uh, the work that we do. And he brought that work to the White House. And he believed that if elected president, he would use his power to do three things, restore the soul of our nation, which you have heard him talk about many, many times, which uh, is in an existential crisis and a decision that we all have to make, not only in the United States, but in the world, between author authoritarianism and democracy, top-down governance versus bottom-up governance. And he thinks the only way we can do this is to unite the country. And he thinks the way to do that is to do what it is that we do best. See, there are lots of things that we cannot control in this world, things that we have to react to, things that put us in harm's way. But there are things that we can control, and those things that we can control, making ourselves stronger from within, investing in ourselves, and investing in infrastructure that we actually need to live, to breathe, and to work every day is critically important. And so he got about the business of making sure that we got that done. A lot of people have talked this talk for a very long time. Mayors in this room, you don't even need to raise your hand, don't out yourself. How many conferences and meetings we had about an infrastructure bill? It was going to be an infrastructure week. It was going to be whatever. Well, let me tell you something. This guy got in there, put pedal to metal, made it happen, $1.2 trillion. Ladies and gentlemen, now we're going to have an infrastructure decade. That's what we're doing right now. $1.2 trillion to rebuild the roads, the bridges, the airports, the ports, the waterways, high-speed internet so that a little girl doesn't need to be sitting in the back of her mama's car outside of McDonald's trying to learn so that why? Why do we make it so hard? She's the one who's going to find the cure for cancer. She's the one that's going to find the answer to maternal mortality rates. She's the one who's actually going to lead the country, and yet we are starving her for knowledge. And so the president says, why don't we get access to knowledge, because that's the great equalizer to every person in the United States of America, so we can realize the benefits and the genius of all of us being together, because diversity is this nation's greatest strength and our greatest opportunity. Roads, bridges, airports, ports, waterways, high-speed internet, but then clean air and safe water. In the United States of America, in the second decade of the 21st century, we have two million people that don't have running sewage systems in their houses. 
I saw a little girl in the Imperial Valley the other day whose mom and daddy dig dirt and pull alfalfa uh, out who live in a trailer park that has arsenic in the water that she drinks. I was up in Napakiak Village, way the hell up there in Alaska, not too long ago, in a tribal community that's suffering from the deteriorations of coastal restoration. Clean air and safe water, Superfund sites, brownfield sites. You know what this is? These are people who didn't learn from their mama that they shouldn't clean up what they messed up. Hmm, that's right. You can say true that, because I'm from New Orleans. <laughs> and so we're going to go clean that up, and you're going to do it in your communities. And then finally, confronting the existential crisis that's before us, which is a clean energy economy, because the climate crisis is killing us as we speak. I'm from the city of New Orleans. I know what a deteriorating coast looks like. The coast in New Orleans disappears at 100 yards every 45 minutes. By the time I leave here today, we're going to lose another football field. We've already lost the size of Delaware. That's happening all over the country with sea level rise. And with, we're having heat waves. We're having fires. We're having hurricanes. We're having tornadoes. We're having the whole doggone thing. And we have to fight that as well. And so the president asked me to work with all of you. And two years in, you can ask us how we're doing. Thank you for asking. We, <laughs> we've pushed $300 billion out of the door. We have 38,000 projects coursing across this country. Thank you. In 99 counties uh, in America. I have traveled over 120,000 miles. I have been to over 110 cities, towns, counties, or tribal communities working with each and every one of you to rebuild the country. Because at the end of the day, this is what I learned helping rebuild the city of New Orleans, that it works when we all come together. You will hear the president say this every time he talks. When we do things together, when we seek and find common ground, there is nothing that we cannot do if we make sure that we don't leave anybody behind. And we will build a country from the bottom up and the middle out that will be so strong we never have to look over our shoulder again and think about going backwards, but only think about going forward. You know what I call that? Building a bridge to the future. And that is what this conference is all about. It's not just a real big bridge. It is a figurative bridge, one that people actually need to get from where we are to a better tomorrow, because we're not going to build the country back the way it was. We're not going back. We're not turning around, like we say in the South. We're going forward. And we're going forward in a way that works for everybody. And that is what the president wants to do. But we cannot do that without a good, strong federal partner, which, ladies and gentlemen, you have in spades right now. As mayors and executives, you have never had a president that cares this much about getting money to the ground and working with cities. But you also need states working well. So the governor's got to be called into communion, as I like to say, on this. But guess else who's got to show up? The people who actually make it happen. Now, I know a little bit about being a mayor. It was the best job I have ever had. Don't, don't tell my boss I just said that. <laughs> But y'all know what this is like. If you got to go to the grocery store in the morning to get some milk for your kid's cereal, you're going to be about 45, 50 minutes, because somebody may going to grab you. You're going to get your clothes clean. You go into the ballpark. Somebody's going to grab you and, and just say, listen, I know that you're really busy, and I know I'm sure you got to take your kids to school. But while I got you, <laughs> and they do have you, and you know that the immediacy of the things that you say hit the ground right away, so you can hear, you hear the reverberation as we speak. There is no other elected job in America that's got that much responsibility and that much proximity to reality than anywhere in the else, which is why mayors rule the world. And that is why Mike Bloomberg understands that and Joe Biden understands that as well. And so as I leave you today, let me, number one, thank you for all the work that you have done. But let me put a little bit of weight on your shoulders. The world is a difficult place. There's a lot of tough stuff happening. It's not all lollipops and roses. Sometimes it's agony. Sometimes it's pain. Sometimes it's catastrophic events. And yes, sometimes it's terrorist attacks. And we have to remain in solidarity with our brothers and sisters around the world who suffer from that as well. And so as I end, besides thanking you, let me tell you, don't let the time that you have in peace go to waste. You have a chance, one chance, a once in a generation chance, because it hasn't happened in the last 50 years, and it will not happen again, to rebuild this country in a way that makes it really strong so that we don't ever have to look back again. And you, ladies and gentlemen, are the architects of building a bridge to the future. So I'll leave that with you 
I hope you feel the weight of that responsibility. I hope you know that you don't have unending numbers of days in office. There are actually 1,460 days in a four-year term of office. And the day that gun goes off, it does not go back. The Biden administration is in day 1,000 of that, and we count every day, because once you lose that time, it's never coming back. So God bless you all. God bless the United States of America. And what I'd like to say on behalf of the president is let's get the hell to work. So thank you very much. Before I, before I depart this, this lovely stage, we have um, a message from uh, two of our fellow mayors uh, who are in Israel, the mayor of Surat uh, and the mayor of Gezer. Uh, they will both uh, come to us with messages. Uh, they unfortunately could not be here, and you know why, but I will let them speak for themselves. Uh, thank you. My name is Rotem Yadlin. I'm the mayor of Gezer Regional County. Uh, Gezer Regional County is uh, halfway between Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. It's located uh, between 40 to 55 kilometers from uh, Gaza. So my name is Alon Davidi. I'm the mayor of Zderot in the last 10 years. I don't know if you know where is Zderot. Zderot is the city that is the, the, the closest city that we have in Israel to Gaza border. We are something like 800 meters from the border of Gaza and Zderot have 36,000 36, people that live in the town. I was actually, I pretty much, uh, pretty fast understood that uh, there was a war that was starting. It was 6.30 in the morning. Uh, we walk up uh, from actually um, rockets uh, in the air. I had to run with my kids first to the uh, safe room, safe room in the house and see that they're okay. And then I went out. And I, as I was driving to the operation room in, uh, in the regional uh, county, you could see um, the fires going on around. I'm actually a mayor without citizens because most of uh, my people, my uh, citizens, need to vacuum from uh, the city because uh, in the last Saturday, uh, 45, Terrorists from the Hamas come inside to my city, murder more than 42 uh, citizens and officers from the army and from the police. And now Zderot is a dangerous place to be there. A current mayor, a colleague, a friend of mine, he had four kids and a wife. He was living in one of those communities that was invaded uh, by the terrorists of Hamas. And when he heard at 6.30, the, the rockets going around and the sirens, he left his house. He left his uh, wife and three of the kids in the safe room in his house and went out to save the people of his region uh, to see what's going on, to run the war, just as I did in my county far farther away from Gaza. Um, Ophir was killed fighting for his community to save them. It's a very dangerous, and it's a very uh, dangerous place to be there. Besides that we're afraid that more and more terrorists come to the town and we wait, we wait. We talked about the trauma, but also as a mayor, I keep thinking about uh, the houses that, was, that were burned down, the infrastructure that has been ruined. How do you rebuild the community, not only um, not only the community, the people of the community, but the community as a whole. My job is to take care about my people. And all of my people, most of them, most of them, they are around Israel, in the south, in the, in the north, in the center, in Jerusalem. And I, I'm in charge to give them the support and, and to give them all what I can to help them. Some of them lost their kids, some lost their parents. Um, we started to see how we can, uh, people that are going to move into our community, we need to get them into the school system in, in our region. And how, how do you do it in, uh, in, in, in the right way so those people can start the rest of their lives? I need to give them some uh, normal life 
in this situation, like example, uh, we built now a virtual uh, uh, schools and a kindergarten and, and many things, many things. Uh, uh, imagine yourself, wh what you need in the, in the morning, what you need in the afternoon, I need to do it to give them the support, but they are not with me now in Zderot. They are, they are uh, 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 in all over Israel. It's very tough to me, but we in charge about that. And really, I try to make the job. I try to help them. Uh, the government uh, tried to help. And I want to say thank you very much. Thank you very much to your leader, to the President Biden with his speech. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you mayors, I really wanted to be in Washington at this time with you. Uh, this is where I'm supposed to be. Uh, but now I have to stay in my community and lead the way. Uh, how do you rebuild a community that has been th through a trauma such as this one? This is the main question I keep um, thinking about in my head. I don't know how to say it. Raise support to the people of the world. The third is when after the world will finish, my uh, municipality have a center of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, to work with post-trauma. We have all the experiments that uh, we take from more than 20 years in this situation. I think this is the, the darkest time of Israel, but it's also the brightest time of Israel. The people of Israel give me hope. I know that uh, our nation, we believe in uh, life, we believe to build a, a good future to all of the world. So in this time, I'm in a dark, really in a big dark, because to see all the pain of the people, all the crying of the baby and the crying of the family that need help, it's very, very tough to me. All of our community is working. Some of them went to the reserves, some of them uh, pack lunches, help people that uh, got out of their houses and, and, and moved away. There are a lot of communities that don't have a place to live. Um, so it might be our darkest hour, but it is also our brightest one. I know the people of Israel are strong. I think the support of the world, uh, the support of the uh, leaders of the world, saying uh, we're not alone, knowing uh, the terrorism cannot win. And now, a conversation with the mayor of Washington, D.C., Muriel Bowser, and reporter for The Washington Post, Michael Bryce Sadler. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mayor. Oh, Hi, nice how are you? It's you. great. Doing well. Doing well. Uh, so over the past few years, mayors have found themselves increasingly at the center of major crises, whether that be global conflicts from Ukraine to Israel, the global pandemics. Here in the district and many other cities, one of the biggest challenges with pandemic recovery has been how to resurrect downtown corridors. Workers have been slow to return to their offices, and that challenge is especially unique in D.C. because we have so many federal workers downtown. So, Mayor Bowser, when you talk about D.C.'s pandemic recovery, why is there such an emphasis on downtown? Well, first, let me say we're in a beautiful downtown facility here at Johns Hopkins University. So we want to welcome Johns Hopkins to our wonderful university community and our wonderful downtown. So thank you, Johns Hopkins. And um, I think it's important when we talk about global capitals like ours that we talk about their vibrancy. Uh, and we know that downtowns are the heart of any community. Uh, and they're also the commercial heart of the community. And that's especially true for us uh, in Washington, DC. Uh, there are 185,000 jobs uh, downtown and the downtown's economy, especially its property values, uh, really drive what we're able to do in the city. Uh, so when I talk about making sure we have a vibrant and growing and thriving downtown, I'm also saying that we need to continue the historic investments that we've made in public education 
because it's those values that allow us to make those investments. Uh, when I say we have to make sure that we have our jobs and businesses downtown, it also means that we can make uh, tremendous investments in some of, some of the initiatives that allow us um, to provide every Washingtonian with a fair shot. Uh, and then I'm talking about our homeless services programs, I'm talking about our black home ownership program, and I'm talking about making the wards in our city that have been separated and underinvested in, uh, making sure uh, that they can also thrive. Uh, but the downtown uh, drives the revenues um, that allow us to make those investments. You talked a bit about those commercial properties and how important that is to our economy. Uh, the CFO last month noted that office vacancies by 2026 might reach 25% in the city. Um, that's a big hit. So what's your plan, what's your strategy to mitigate that vacancy percentage? Well, um, I don't know that that's where we're going to be in 2026. Uh, what I know is where we are today. Uh, and standing here or sitting here this October, uh, what the CFO did, he had to upgrade his estimate just from February, uh, where the view was very pessimistic about where we would be, um, not only in vacancy, but in revenue. Uh, and what that upgrade is allowing us to do is kind of rethink um, those out years um, and accelerate in some cases the investments that we make to make sure that what we think is a very pessimistic outlook for 2026 won't actually be realized. Right. And those federal workers that I mentioned, mm -hmm. um, you've talked about it a lot that the city can't necessarily rely on those workers to come back to the office. Uh, has there been any momentum on that front, talking with the White House about getting federal workers back? Um, for sure, and I think most uh, people know that we're different in Washington, D.C., uh, and we are a city, county, state all at once. I'm a mayor, county executive, and almost governor also. Uh, we're blocks from the capital of the United States of America, yet we don't have any voting representation. Did you hear me? <laughs> I mean, our congresswoman can't vote, and we don't have two senators. So we're unique. Um, now, there are some good things about being that special. Um, and one is that the mayor, county executive governor, me, uh, and 13 council members make the decisions for our $20 billion budget for 700,000 people. So that relatively flat structure allows us to move quickly and uh, to pivot quickly. Uh, and what I have uh, tasked uh, all of our agencies to do uh, is focus on our five-year economic development strategy. Um, just this week, uh, I had the opportunity to name a new leader of our economic development efforts, and she's here, Nina Albert. Thank you, Nina. Uh, Nina comes to us from the federal government, where she was the public buildings commissioner. Uh, and brings a wealth of experience and knowledge about how we can reposition some of our buildings. This was what every mayor here knows, is that we're not gonna go back to 2019. Uh, so our downtowns won't be exactly the same. Hybrid work uh, is likely here to stay, um, but, but it is. This is the new uh, way of work. And so what we have done in our economic development strategy is certainly focus and set some pretty big goals for the downtown, including adding 15,000 residents uh, and investing in a pretty aggressive commercial to housing uh, conversion uh, program. Uh, and it's working. We know that we have 22 properties in various stages of conversion in the city right now. Uh, one thing that we learned from this pandemic is our downtown is too commercial heavy. Um, almost 90% of the space is dedicated to commercial space. Even in, in, in our neighborhoods in the district um, that have more uh, commercial and a, a better balance be, between commercial and residential it fared much better during the pandemic. So we're really focused on how we bring more um, people downtown to live. Uh, and look at different ways of repurposing our properties. Now, I had a kind of a spicy message uh, to the president in my inaugural address in January. 
Um, it was the third one, so I, you get a little bit spicier, I think. Uh, but what I said to the president, and it's a, you know, it's a direct message, but also one that needed to be said, uh, was that we need the federal government to rethink its properties and either have a purposeful plan for conversions or let us do it. Turn them over to us and we'll figure it out. Now here, it's great that we're in this building because we have some spaces and leasers are one thing, I'll put them to the side. But we have some buildings. Now our city is a capital city built on the L'Enfant plan. Wide avenues and majestic buildings, right? It is supposed to convey the, the, um, the power of our democracy. And so we have many buildings like that um, maybe 12, Treasury, Justice, Commerce, that's across from my, my office. And those buildings were built for one purpose, federal workers. Um, and so if they're not being used to their highest and best use, um, we need to figure out what to do with them. I point to this building because it was a museum. And uh, through my, you know, Mayor Bloomberg's incredible um, vision and investment in partnership with Johns Hopkins, Hopkins University, it was repurposed, and I have to say, as much as we love the museum, this is a higher and better use. And so we have to have that kind of vision and investment when we think about um, our grand buildings. And you talked about that goal, adding 15,000 new residents downtown. So there's this emphasis on not just maybe converting buildings or repurposing buildings, but bringing new populations to the city and then also retaining them. So you can talk more about that strategy and how it's going. Um, well, it's going well. Um, many of us were worried and many cities lost population during the pandemic. People went back home, they moved in with parents, they moved abroad because they could work from anywhere. Uh, and we saw our population decrease. Uh, in the most recent revenue estimate that you referred to, we're seeing that bounce back. So our residents are coming back. Uh, people continue to love to, to live in cities, to be close to transportation, parks, culture. Uh, our fantastic public school systems where we have free pre-K starting at age three, free and it's universal. Um, so those types of things attract um, people back to cities. And so the conversion strategy is a residential growth strategy because what we would be doing is adding housing. And then there's another element to this too you've talked a lot about, which is sports. Yeah. Uh, you want DC to be the sports capital. No, DC is the sports capital. <laughs> Um, well, I think people would love to hear more about that and then, of course, the talk about the Washington commanders and attracting them. I would, but if you would, I'm happy to talk about sports, um, but part of our strategy um, that I have to mention before we, we go there is how we also are retaining employees in our government. Um, and, and over the last years, there's been a great competition for talent Everybody's trying to figure out the change of ways of work. And for the mayors who are running cities and have to provide incredible city services, we continue to need police officers, teachers, firefighters, 911 call takers, case managers. Uh, and there's just an incredible um, competition for that talent. Uh, so we have been very uh, grateful to partner with Bloomberg Philanthropies and we have an I-team um, that's really supported us in thinking about uh, our, our talent pool. Um, so we are happy uh, that we're, going, we're creating a new partnership with our uh, HBCUs in DC. Those are historically black colleges. And we have uh, two fantastic leaders. Uh, first for our university, the University of the District of Columbia, Dr. Maurice Eddington, who is here. Where's Dr. Eddington? <laughs> Um, as, as well as uh, Howard University, often referred to as the Mecca uh, for uh, in historic black, historically black colleges, and their new leader, Dr. Ben Vincent. So thank you, Dr. Vincent, for being here. Uh, so what these uh, great leaders, are, they're partnering with us to create the HBCU Public Service Program. Uh, where we will hire apprentices, graduates from, uh, a, uh, from Howard and UDC, 
and uh, guarantee uh, that they will be matched in a good paying job in DC government, hopefully to grow their careers. So that's a great part of what we're doing. Why was, why was the focus on HBCU so important there? Uh, it's so important for us when I look at um, part of my job uh, is to manage 34,000 people and to always make sure that we have the talent that we need. Um, now, one privilege that I have of longevity, uh, and I am currently in my uh, ninth year as, as being mayor, is really seeing uh, how to grow leaders in the government, and I have a real focus on that from the cabinet level where I make appointments, but also from the entry level um, in attracting uh, great people who want to work for us. What we learned is people come to DC, they come to universities like Howard and UDC and Johns Hopkins for that matter, because they want to be part of a, a, a public service. They have a change the world mindset. And uh, you can do that in local government. And we want people to know they don't have to move away, they don't have to work for a think tank, they don't have to work for the feds, they can do that in local government. I fell in love with local government because of the speed. Uh, I could have an idea one day, get it funded, and implement it in a year's time. And you can't do that anywhere else. Well, thank you so much for thank the you. time, Mayor. You, thank I appreciate you. appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome the Mayor of South Yorkshire, UK, Oliver Copard, Senior Counselor for Technology and Economic Growth to Secretary Raimondo at the U.S. Department of Commerce, Zoe Baird. Mayor of Columbus, Ohio, USA, Andrew Gintner, with D.C. Bureau Chief at Bloomberg News, Peggy Collins. Good morning, everyone. It's a privilege to be here with you. I thought we would start with Mayor Copper because he has traveled the furthest from England to be with us today. Thank you so much, Mayor. So Mayor, you oversee a region in the UK that is the first investment zone in the UK and also has received an initial private sector investment from Boeing recently of about 80 million pounds, I think it is. So can you share with us a little bit about what already that has meant for the economy in your region? Yeah. So. South Yorkshire is not just the first investment zone. South Yorkshire was the place that pioneered steel manufacturing. We were the world's first advanced manufacturing innovation district. So we also are now um, the UK's first investment zone. That's essentially an 80 million pound, about 100 million dollar package of support from the UK government, which allows us to focus our strengths in advanced manufacturing, um, particularly our research strengths. Um, and through that money, we've been able to bring in Boeing. So Boeing's only manufacturing facility in Europe is in South Yorkshire. And the second facility was as a result of the investment zone. So now it's getting to a point where if you're, not in, ad if you're in advanced manufacturing and you're not in South Yorkshire, that's your problem, not my problem. So uh, we're pretty excited about that. Well, Mayor Ginther, um, when we bring it back to the U.S., your state of Ohio has, actually, has also been a big beneficiary of this huge shift we've seen in industrial policy in the U.S., probably the biggest shift since World War II. And in Ohio, you've seen investments by Intel to build a new chips manufacturing center and then also a new battery plant. So can you tell us a little bit about how that's going in terms of jobs that are being created and other investments in your region? Yeah, there, it's been pretty transformational. We already had the fastest growing economy in the Midwest, creating 27,000 jobs over the last eight years. And so 3,000 permanent full-time jobs with Intel and 2,500 with the Honda LG plant uh, to our west. And so um, an incredible time. We really are trying to move with an intensity around growth, but being purposeful and intentional because we know that growth without purpose and intention and a plan sometimes can be an accelerant to disparities and inequities. So along with job creation and workforce development, partnering with our community college, we're making huge commitments around housing and transit to make sure that the workforce that we're building are able to access these jobs. Because of course, you know, for the permanent jobs at Intel and Honda, 
there are about 10 jobs being created for every one job there with suppliers and vendors. So it's, it's gonna be, require all of us to do things differently. We were rewriting our zoning code for the first time in 70 years to embrace density and height, uh, which as you can imagine in the Midwest uh, is gonna have its challenges with, uh, with culture. But uh, we're making our way. But uh, being a workforce hub uh, identified by the First Lady, uh, we're grateful for that. None of this would have happened without the CHIPS Act. And so I wanna thank uh, the president and the Biden administration for making that a reality. Well, you mentioned the word workforce a couple of times there. And Zoe, I want to bring you in because you've had so much experience in your career around the workforce. And you work now for the Secretary of Commerce that's deploying so much of the funds around the CHIPS Act. Can you talk to us a little bit about the federal government, how the federal government is trying to help prepare the workforce for some of these new jobs? Sure, it's such a pleasure to be here with you today. So while I am now working for the federal government, I used to represent state and local governments in the Supreme Court, and so I'm a big believer in what you do and know that we can't do any of this without you. The CHIPS Act has been mentioned. It's an extraordinary investment, um, $52 billion on the part of the federal government in developing the semiconductor industry in your communities, but more importantly, that those resources are meant to be a catalyst for private investment. And I think you're seeing, as was mentioned in Ohio, enormous private investment to bring this critical industry back to the US. We really dropped the ball and let this go offshore, and this is one of the areas where the president is deeply committed to reinvigorating critical industries in the US and in communities. And the workforce component of this is enormously important. The CHIPS and Science Act will create uh, 100,000 construction jobs. It'll create 90,000 technicians, people to operate the fabs. Most of these jobs don't require a four-year college degree. But we also need to accelerate the number of engineers that we have so that we can continue to be on the forefront, not just in this sector, but in other critical technology sectors. Um, so it's really a privilege for us uh, at the Commerce Department and in the federal government to develop these programs. And I know you heard Mitch Landrieu talk about the infrastructure programs in the same vein. It's really a privilege for us to develop these programs in conjunction with local government because you're going to need to create the sectoral partnerships that will enable people to get the training they need, training that leads to jobs. Secretary Raimondo likes to say, we're not in it for train and pray. We're really focused, and, and those of you who've looked at the CHIPS uh, Notice of Funding Opportunity and the many other funding programs that we have out of the Inflation Reduction Act and otherwise, all of these have very robust workforce um, investments in them in conjunction with local communities, encouraging the creation of sectoral partnerships so businesses are identifying the jobs that are needed, the training providers are able to bring forward the training opportunities, and you're able to connect all of this so that people know which training to take, and that training leads to real jobs. So you're at the point of the sphere, and we're really privileged to work with you. So Mayor Carver, let me go back to you on this front. You know, my colleagues at City Lab have been doing a lot of reporting about the efforts in the UK to, to level up, as you say, parts of the country and region that have been left behind somewhat, particularly in northern UK where you are. But it's been a challenge. So can you talk to us a little bit about what challenges you're seeing to getting the success that you want to have there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the so-called leveling up program that the government have been pursuing is designed to try and um, make the north of the UK just as prosperous and productive, importantly, as the south of the country. And at the moment, that just isn't the case. Now, the government promised us a load of transport infrastructure, which hasn't quite materialised. But on things like the investment zone, we have seen that investment in places like South Yorkshire. So we're determined that through advanced manufacturing, in the same way as uh, places in this country, uh, we can regenerate our economies and our communities and deliver that right throughout our communities. So I was in St. Louis um, just uh, last week and over the weekend talking to colleagues in St. Louis about their approach to advanced manufacturing, being very similar with Mayor Jones. 
being very similar to the challenges that we face because this isn't just about leveling up the country in the UK, it's also about leveling up my region. So the jobs and opportunities through that investment zone and on the world's first advanced manufacturing innovation district have to be just as accessible to those people that are adjacent to that site, which come from, it's surrounded by some of the, of Northern Europe's poorest communities, a place called Darnall, Attercliffe. Um, so I have to make sure that not just that the world sees that South Yorkshire is leading on advanced manufacturing, but that my own community sees that we're leading on advanced manufacturing and that they can access those opportunities and stay near and go far. Mayor Ginther, you mentioned a couple of things when you were talking earlier that are critical to success. Mm. Housing you mentioned. What are some of the things you're doing to attract workers in this very tight labor market, like affordable housing, childcare, which I know is a big part of the CHIPS Act? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think Oliver uh, hit right on it, and that is, and I think this is true for communities around the country, but really the world. The communities that are acting regionally, as opposed to, you know, in their city's own specific interests. There are many communities you go to where cities and counties don't get along, cities and suburban communities uh, aren't able to work together. And I think the, the communities around the world that are growing and thriving are those that are acting regionally. So the two uh, job centers that you've uh, shared here today are in adjacent counties. They're not actually in Franklin County where the city of Columbus is, the but because plant. the battery plant and Intel are both in adjacent counties, but obviously transformational projects for all of central Ohio. So we were part of bringing utilities because there's a huge water demand obviously for both of those and we could help provide that for a commitment to shared revenue around income tax revenue, which is how basic civity services are funded in Columbus, as well as commitments to workforce and to housing. I think what we've discovered is that our community college, and Intel has a proud history of this in Phoenix and other places around the country, is a great place for us to partner. And luckily we're blessed with a great community college there's not a bigger advocate for community colleges in America than the First Lady, who is a community college professor. And so using Columbus State, we've unveiled something called the Columbus Promise, and that is every graduate of Columbus City Schools can receive an associate's degree or two years of training debt-free uh, through Columbus State Community College. One of the other things we're doing is really trying, because we talked about skilled trades, you know, 7,000 construction jobs at Intel, 3,000 for Honda. And even after these projects are complete, there'll be thousands of skilled tradespeople required to be on these sites to maintain them into the future. And so build, in partnership with the county, we've unveiled Building Futures, which really tries to focus on getting folks that haven't necessarily been welcome in the trades in the past, uh, women, people of color, uh, even restored citizens that are come back and looking for opportunities to provide for their families. So that's some of the ways, in addition to using some of our rescue plan dollars for childcare, that's been absolutely critical. We know that there is uh, nearly two million women that left the workforce at the beginning of the pandemic that have not come back. And a major, major issue is having uh, affordable, high quality childcare. So Zoe, the mayor was just talking about some of the things they're learning as they tried to skill up some of the workers. When you think about our allies and what you've learned from the way they're approaching the workforce, what are, what are some of the takeaways that you have? Because this is an issue in terms of the shifting industrial policy that we're not only seeing in the US, but we're seeing globally. No, it's very true. There's no country in the world that has developed a system of training their adult workforce. And so we're all challenged at the same time to figure this out. Um, we've created, uh, when the president first was elected, he went to Europe and he said to the Europeans, let's create a trade and technology council and collaborate on building the jobs in technology that are going to matter in the future and building our industries and our common approaches to this. And out of that, we created a Talent for Growth Task Force where we're collaborating with the Europeans and trying to learn from the successes in your communities and the challenges in your communities as well as in theirs. And one of the things that is very clear is we all have the same challenge, as the mayor was saying, of getting women into the, into the technology workforce. Women don't see themselves in these jobs. Women don't uh, understand how to access the training, which is true generally for the population. 
Uh, but if we can't get women into these jobs that are going to be significant in the future, first of all, we won't have enough people for these jobs. And secondly, we'll miss enormous talent that could be contributing and benefiting from the growth of these technologies. So one of the things we've done in the implementation of the CHIPS Act, which has been alluded to here, is that we've required childcare for the major investments that we're making. Because if we don't have childcare, we won't have women in these jobs. And we want this to be a primary area of women's contribution. The same is true for the whole range of um, attracting young people into these jobs. You know, the semiconductor industry doesn't have the same cachet as internet service providers. Um, you know, we're trying to get young people to see that when you um, work in construction these days, you're not necessarily breaking down a brick wall with a sledgehammer, you're operating a robot, it's really cool. <laughs> um, and so we're trying to get people of color to see themselves in these jobs to create um, the context and environment in which the diversity of our populations want to work. America's great strength has always been the diversity of its population, and we really need to drive that through our present investments for the future. You know, people are concerned about AI and, and other uh, technologies that are becoming more and more visible to them. Um, and we want people to feel and see and experience the enormous prospect that they have individually in participating in these sectors. And you'll know in your own communities that over 50 community colleges have now developed semiconductor training programs that you know didn't exist before. So uh, the educational institutions are becoming aware of the training opportunities, the new needs. We're trying to get rapid and affordable training for people and collaborating with our allies in doing this because it is a global problem. Mayor Crawford, would you like to jump in here about you know, how it's going in terms of pulling in some of these workers from the younger generations or more diverse populations where you are? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with what uh, we've just heard because that absolutely is the challenge. As much as we have some uh, incredible facilities in South Yorkshire, and we absolutely do, um, giving those communities that are in my region access to um, those facilities is a whole other challenge. And that is a skills challenge, absolutely. It's also a transport challenge. Um, and there is also a more fundamental health challenge in there. One third of our productivity challenge in South Yorkshire is down to poor health outcomes and health inequalities. Mm -hmm. um, we have a 20 year healthy life expectancy gap in South Yorkshire. Uh, so you can't work in an advanced manufacturing facility if you're simply not well enough to access those jobs, if you can't get there on public transport, um, or if you don't have the skills. So we're doing um, a huge amount of work investing in all of those um, areas in order to give everybody the opportunity to access um, those facilities that we're so proud of in our building. And I'm determined to build uh, not just a bigger economy, but a better economy. And that has to be about making sure that everybody can access those opportunities. And if there's anybody in the room that wants to help us with those challenges, I'm all ears. Well, we only have a couple of minutes left, but Mayor, I wanted to come back to you and ask the same question um, of both of you as well. When you think about trying to build a better economy, which you're doing in your region, what excites you most about what's happening right now? Well, there's so many things, and I think it's important for us to say as well, you know, the CHIPS Act and bringing uh, chip manufacturing, reshoring that to the United States is great for economic development and job creation. But it's also uh, a matter of national and economic security. So you think about back in 1990, about 37% of the chips that were made worldwide were produced in the United States. Uh, I believe last year it was 12. And so if we've learned anything over the last few years, uh, there are a lot of forces in the world that are not interested in our national and economic security. And so this is a matter for us to move you know, just you know, here in the United States and with our allies around the world uh, to continue to build and own the future, not only creating great jobs, more pathways to the middle class, uh, but also to protect our national and economic security. So workforce is gonna continue to be a top priority for that. Zoe, to you, what's most exciting to you right now about trying to build a better economy broadly in the US? 
I think what's really exciting is what's happening all over the country, whether it's advanced manufacturing or semiconductors or uh, clean uh, energy um, industries. There's a vibrancy, and as the president said, he's very committed to rebuilding the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. And you see that from all the communities in which you work. This is not the federal government um, telling you what to do. It's creating opportunity along with the industries and the employers that enable you to create the kinds of sectoral partnerships that are rebuilding your community in the way that's appropriate and strongest for the people in your own community. So there's enormous diversity in what's happening in the implementation of these programs. And it's because of how you're leading in your communities. And that's what's really exciting to see. And Mayor Coppard, can you bring us home, but via the UK? <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're hugely excited by the opportunities that um, our innovation capability, our advanced manufacturing can bring to our community. South Yorkshire in common with, I think, a number of places in the US, not least our friends in St. Louis, um, has had a tough time post-industrially. We, we were a post-industrial community. And yet what we're now seeing is that through advanced manufacturing, technology, um, digital health tech, uh, we're able to create a new future for our communities. I was elected 18 months ago on a promise to restore the pride, purpose, and prosperity of South Yorkshire. And I think through advanced manufacturing, the investment zone that we now have, we're absolutely on a path to be able to deliver on that promise. Well, thank you so much to our esteemed panelists, and thanks to all of you for being here today. Thank you. And now, a conversation with the mayor of Mesa, Arizona, USA, John Giles, first deputy mayor of New York City, USA, Sheena Wright, with CBS News national correspondent, anchor of the Saturday edition of the CBS Weekend News, Adriana Diaz. if I can get up on this chair here. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm so glad we're having this conversation with First Deputy Mayor Wright from my native New York City and Mesa, Arizona Mayor John Giles, where I may retire one day. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's my hope, my fondest hope for all of you, that you will retire in Mesa. A quick plug there. So we're here talking about the migrant crisis, which has united probably many of you in the room, whether you're near the border or far from the border. We have two mayors who are dealing with this and a first deputy mayor every single day, so it's really important to get their perspective. It's something that me and my colleagues have been covering uh, for decades, but through the years, certainly. I recently was based in Chicago, so we would visit police stations where migrants had to sleep on the floor because there was nowhere else to go. And what they were experiencing was a lot of confusion. They told us a lack of information. And nearly everyone at, at one police station I went to was from Venezuela. Mm. What our reporting is showing us is that there's been a change in the demographics of migration right now. Recently, we're seeing a lot of Venezuelans who don't have ties in the US, who therefore are relying more on city services. It's not like uh, many of the Central Americans who came before who might have family or sponsors. Is that what you're seeing on the ground? I'll start with you first, Deputy Mayor. Absolutely. And as you, everyone knows, New York City is a city of immigrants. And what has been the traditional story is that people would come, uh, like you would send a scout, like my family uh, is from Jamaica, and they would get rooted, they'd get a job, and they would send for the next wave and the next wave. And it would be a growth over time. This is a situation where you have literally hundreds of thousands of people showing up all at once with no ties and no ability to work. So we've had 130,000 people come in over the past 12 months uh, with no ability to work and 65,000 people that we're still caring for every single day, providing housing, food, school, everything. And it has been uh, really unprecedented. Uh, expected to cost the city over three years about $12 billion to support uh, all of the people who are coming. So it is, it is an unprecedented challenge, and uh, we're not built for it. And, and really, we need some uh, urgent solutions. 
Mayor Giles, you're about two hours from the border. What's been your experience, and where are you seeing the most strain on your resources? Is it housing? Is it providing school for kids? Is it trying to balance the needs of your local community, the unhoused, with the needs of this new population? Well, it, we have seen changes, as you mentioned earlier. Well, I was on our city council back in the 1990s, and I remember back then we had primarily uh, illegal uh, immigrants that were uh, from Mexico, and we on our street corners we had day laborers that were waiting for folks to come by and hopefully give them a day's labor. And I remember complaining to the federal government back then, and this was in the 90s. Uh, and since then, I, I've been the mayor for nine years. I remember right after I was elected mayor, we had a, a surge of uh, unaccompanied minors. And that's when I, when I first began getting phone calls from the small uh, evangelical Spanish-speaking churches in my city that were being asked by uh, the federal government, can, can we bring three busloads of people to your church tomorrow? And will you take care of them, get overnight, and feed them, and get them on their, on their way to their next location? And, uh, and oh, by the way, they're going to show up without shoes and without backpacks and without the, the basic necessities of life, because we will we'll have taken that away from them at the border. So, and, and then we went from unaccompanied minors to families, and, and now, as you indicated, it's a lot of non-Mexican uh, immigrants, migrants, uh, that, uh, that don't have resources. But we, we were uh, typically kind of a way station, and, and, and we were set up for, with Spanish speakers and folks to accommodate people with those needs. Recently, we had busloads of, uh, of French-speaking Africans showed up, and so that kind of threw us for a loop. You know, how to, wait a minute, we got to adjust. So uh, we have seen it ebb and flow and change, and, uh, but uh, the, the constant has been that this has, has been, for, for border state mayors, this has been something that we've been very concerned about and trying to get the attention of the federal government for, or from, for, for decades. Very excited that we now have New York City and other uh, advocates joining that chorus of of local leaders that are asking for some federal assistance. So on that point, you know, whether you think it's moral to bus migrants or too political to bus migrants, one of the objectives of Governor Greg Abbott was to get northern cities and cities across the country to start uh, getting a bit of a taste of what border towns and border cities are dealing with. Have you seen any value in that? Well, I, I, we all need to condemn using people as political pawns. Uh, that's uh, immoral. <laughs> So I, I don't want to give any credit to that at all. But I, I, I am very, as I indicated earlier, very grateful to, to Mayor Adams, uh, Deputy Mayor Wright, for adding their, their, their voices to this topic. We need to raise awareness here in Washington, D.C., that this is not a, this is kind of a, a favorite political problem a favorite, uh, uh, that the politicians have used for decades. This is an emotional issue. This is an, an issue that they can use to stir up their base. This is not an issue that a lot of people want to solve. This is an issue that they want to use for political advantage. And we need people to see this as a problem that needs to be solved, not as a political wedge that can be used to, to raise money. Mm -hmm. how, how are mayors from cities as different as, as your cities able to work together to find solutions for this problem? I think there's a huge opportunity, and I do think that when cities like New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Washington, D.C. are faced with this head-on, what, what border cities have been faced with for decades, um, it, it really presents an opportunity to work together. Uh, this is something that, you know, crosses political party. Uh, this is, and this is going to be the new normal. I think one of the things that we also have to appreciate with all of the challenges in Central and South America, West Africa, um, climate migration is going to cause great upheaval. We have to think certainly nationally and globally, how are we going to deal with massive waves of people coming, particularly to cities where there's opportunity. And uh, so we're excited, uh, certainly, for, for this mayor in particular, who leads uh, a coalition of the US Conference of Mayors on Immigration Reform to really bring everybody together to start to map out a strategy. The US Conference of Mayors, and you, of course, lead the Immigration Reform Task Force, has been calling for the Biden administration to extend temporary protected status for Venezuelan migrants. Um, that was granted. That was extended. Are you seeing the impact of those migrants now being able to work in the U.S.? 
Has that alleviated a little bit of the pressure, Mayor Giles? That was, that was we were very grateful for, for that change. And, and really because, not just because Venezuelans are all that unique in, in the, the, the mix of, of the problem here, but because it, it represented a, a, a shift of the model. We, we, as the deputy mayor and I were talking just backstage and work authorization is one of the very practical uh, solutions to, to this uh, that, that will help alleviate the, this problem. So in the past, we'd, we'd bring people in, uh, they, they, were entered, they entered the United States 100% legally, but they did so without work authorization. And so it created this warehousing situation in New York City and other places where literally tens of thousands of people were just being stored with, with no hope. You know, no, that, that's a humanitarian crisis, I think, you know, beyond imagination. So the, 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 the shift with the Venezuelan policy is it, it, it acknowledged the reality that in my city, I have more jobs than I have people. Everywhere I go, there's a help wanted sign, and every business leader that I talk to, the first issue that we talk about is workforce. And at the same time, I have this ironic problem of busloads of people coming to my community that cannot work. That, that is an obvious problem, isn't it? We need people to be smart enough to connect those two small dots to one another. Uh, so the, the, this, this shift in the, in the, with the Venezuelan policy was very important. Would you like either of you to see uh, the TPS program extended to other groups from other countries in particular? Absolutely. Um, at, you know, if you've come here, as, as, as Mayor said, uh, in a particular way, you should automatically get the right to work. And, and I think what's really challenging is even though TPS has been designated for Venezuelans, it's still very hard to get. Um, you have to spend about $500 for the application, which makes no sense. Uh, you've got to go through still a lengthy process. So we're setting up a whole a center to help people apply for this, and that's hundreds of people really trying to be in service to thousands of people trying to get work authorization. And that's something as well the federal government should be doing and, and should be certainly making easier to do. But we need it across the board. For people entering from anywhere? Uh, well, you, there's a list of countries, and so w many of the people that are coming to uh, New York City and the other cities that I mentioned are from Venezuela, from Ecuador, um, from uh, countries in West Africa. So we know we, we have a specific request for specific countries uh, where they uh, have the uh, asylee status and need the work authorization. So for people who get the, the asylum status. Yes. Who come in, in that, through that legal process. Um, First Deputy Mayor, as you mentioned, you have 64,000, 65,000 yeah. uh, migrants in the housing system right now. Uh, the mayor's office said that New York City is full and past its breaking point. And he announced uh, just this past Monday that now there's gonna be a 60 day limit for migrant families to remain in the city's shelter system. Of course, you're going to have caseworkers helping people find other housing. But how can that not lead or allow families to be living on the streets? I think what is one of the things that's unique about New York is that we have a, a right to shelter. And so uh, there is an unlimited amount of time where you can be housed by the city. And uh, that 65,000 is on top of another 60,000 uh, New Yorkers who are already in, in our homeless system. So our homeless system has doubled, right, in, in 12 months. And there simply is not enough space or resource. Uh, and we have been uh, negotiating uh, with our stakeholders around this right um, that it, it's just unsustainable. So $12 billion for us means that we'll have cuts to our education, cuts to our public safety, um, you know, infrastructure across the board, and uh, we have to balance. And so we are working very closely with the families, providing intensive case management, uh, reticketing people, and, and helping them to, to move on as best as possible. After 60 days, if they haven't found a place, they can come back and we can try to figure it out. But as you can imagine, every single day, like last week, we had 3,600 people come through. And in a moment's notice, you have to figure out where are they going to, to stay for the night, for the week, for several months. And so we're trying to make room because uh, it's not abating at all. And we are really trying to do the best we can. But will you guarantee housing for a family who hasn't been able to find something through a caseworker? 
uh, there is not, won't be a guarantee, and no other place that's dealing with these issues in all the cities that I mentioned, I think, has an unlimited, there's, there are limits, time limits um, for some of the, the resources and services that are being offered. So we are unique in that, in that sense. So we haven't gotten to that 60 day yet, uh, but we're gonna do our dead level best to, to help support people. But it is, it is, we are past the point where, um, you know, our compassion is unlimited, but our resources are just not. And just to, to end this conversation, something that, that both of you and probably everyone in this room has been calling for is, is comprehensive immigration reform at the federal level. Um, things are moving a little slow uh, at the Capitol these days. So um, <laughs> assuming that won't happen anytime soon, what is one action you'd like to see from the federal government that you think can really make an impact now? I'll start with you, Mayor Giles. Well, we need a, a raised awareness. We need, again, a, a commitment to viewing this as a, as a problem as opposed to an, an, an opportunity for uh, political uh, chaos. Uh, but, but to answer your question, I think we, we already touched on it. Work authorization is a short-term, very achievable thing that I think we could wrap our heads around that would provide some respite if, and allow people the opportunity, get, get us out of the crisis situation that we find ourselves in now. And, and I think that's very attainable. I, I, maybe uh, through executive order or otherwise, if we can just figure out a way to tweak that, maybe similar to the DACA the solution that President Obama came up with, you know, out of necessity uh, in, in a couple of administrations ago. But I, I would focus around work authorization. At least then we can uh, get people productive. We can get people out of, out of warehousing uh, and work on a, hopefully a, a change in attitude that will uh, uh, allow us to take a long-term solution. Chris, happy to write. I would say um, the federal government, in addition to all of those things, operationally taking control of the situation. So coming into the cities, providing the resources that are necessary to provide the services to people. The federal government has places, they have money, um, and, and so that's kind of immediate. And the long term is a decompression strategy. Bring everybody to the table. There are lots of communities that have urgent work needs and opportunities. And if we can really come out with a strategic plan of how are we going to um, repatriate, repopulate, uh, get people to where there's actual opportunity and set up for success, that benefits everyone. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much for your perspective for the both of you. And that is the end. My clock has run out of this segment. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome the founder and principal of ready-made architecture and design, Suchi Reddy. We build our world outward from our bodies, our first home. We inhabit our bodies, our clothing, our homes, our communities, our cities, our countries, our world, and the through line that connects all of these worlds that we build and inhabit is feeling. My first experience with feeling in the power of space happened when I was 10. I was a child growing up in India, and I had my first epiphany that my house was actually shaping the person I was going to become. What's your first memory of space? How did that shape you? This and all of these layers that connect us, our homes, our cities, our worlds, and how we feel about our relationship to one another defines our experience as humans. So how can we ignore it, both as individuals and collectives? And this connection cannot be created only by the silos of planning, development, and governance, but by life-centered grasp of the interdisciplinarity of science, the arts, architecture, and now data and technology. So what are the innovations we have at our disposal to make our cities more livable, feel better, more human, safer, and healthier? Enter the field of neuroaesthetics. I love that word. I fell in love with that word when I first heard it. Um, 
It's the study of how our brains and bodies react to our environments and our experiences. And it's a translational field contributed to by a large group of people around the world working in the fields of neuroscience, their cognitive scientists, environmental psychologists, architects, philosophers, and others. And it aims to illuminate our human experience, urban and otherwise, from the point of view of the body, this democratic space that we all inhabit, irrespective of our sociopolitical, economic, or cultural differences. The brain, the body, our feelings are all activated constantly by our environments. You know you feel different because you're in this space as opposed to any other space. Studies in this field range from identifying the reaction of the body to things like color, texture, proportion, this artwork, or to the rise of heart rate and cortisol as you navigate monotonous streetscapes, to the salutogenic effects of restorative spaces that are missing in many of our urban contexts. And applied to space and urban design, neuroaesthetics becomes neurourbanism. And it helps us to understand, again, how we individually and collectively, as brains and bodies, respond to our environments for the purpose of improving our biological, psychological, social, cultural, and even spiritual outcomes together. So we're in a constant state of being acted on and interacting with our environments in a very real way. You never imagine a spider without its web. Somehow we think as humans we exist outside of the spaces that we're in. And it's actually an incredible intertwining, a constant relationship. So we can measure these interactions, um, as we did in this project that we did with Google and the IAM lab at Johns Hopkins a few years ago, where we had people in different rooms and we measured their physical reactions to these spaces. And what we measured were things like heart rate variability, skin conductance, skin temperature. And we could show people that the space was actually acting on them. There were places they were at ease, their bodies were at ease, there were places where they were not. And this is very important information for us to be able to carry forward as research in this field. We could also do it in an analogous way, where we did in Prospect Park a few years ago, where we covered two acres of the park and 7,000 pinwheels and allowed the diverse communities that surrounded the park to express their feelings both about the park and about the city on these pinwheels. Fully sustainable project, by the way. And a great way to, connect, con co to collect valuable data for the vitality of public space. So if you understand this on a communal scale and a much larger kind of a city scale, um, the knowledge that our built environment acts on us can direct the design of more engaging streetscapes for direct experiential and therefore economic return, better parks for better health, less load on the healthcare system, better transit patterns for lowered stress and cognitive load for healthier communities. So cities such as Stockholm, Melbourne, and Amsterdam, which are pictured here, already implement some of this work. There's zoning that requires a certain amount of openings on a streetscape that will make you feel safer, that allow you to interact with these spaces better. Um, and there are new challenges, as you heard in the panel kind of that went before you, or me, is the monocultures that are affected by immigration. And this is a new frontier for work in feeling and inclusive strategies. So what would happen if we decided to design for what's missing in our collective experience? Could we imagine our cities being designed for states of being so that cities are not imagined just as retail, residential, commercial zones, but as zones for innovation, exploration, connection, restoration, and transition, and that these zones can be imagined at different scales so that they can be healing elements, they can be physical amenities, and they can be economic catalysts. So each zone is designed to amplify vitality and joy. These are complex feelings, vitality and joy. That's not a single feeling. And this is a set of experiences that you could imagine a city being designed for so that it creates this feeling. And this can be the states of being model. So what would it look like, perhaps, to have zones of restoration of multiple scales in our cities, whether it's multiple pods on a, mic on a street or a micropark that's designed to specifically stimulate or soothe your senses? 
can we expand this paradigm of feeling to account for neuroinclusion? 20% of our global population identifies as neurodivergent, and we have to address them in our cities if we are going to be inclusive. Surface level standards, such as building codes and the universal and inclusive design guidelines have demonstrated that neurodivergent people are in need of innovative architecture. And cities have to respond if they're going to evolve. You heard from the mayor of Mesa, Arizona, just before me. Um, they're also pioneers in being an autism certified city where Visit Mesa encouraged and worked with local businesses to partake in autism training so that they could better assist all traveler needs. So the future of design is feeling. Reorienting the compass of design toward feeling is the key to unlocking a paradigm in the design of our communities. It can create restoration, transition, and refuge that we deeply crave and to allow us to sustainably enjoy the vitality and the joy that we look for in our communities. And this has been proven to alleviate the growing urban ills of depression, schizophrenia, and even loneliness. Design can be used to generate equity, empathy, and agency. Designing our cities to support communities must include designing for mental health and physical well-being of the people first. And in doing so, we can generate an economic effect that is sustainable, revolutionary, supportive, and evolutionary. The power of design to amplify feeling and generate change is an indispensable tool for our survival. Thank you. Please welcome Managing Director of SEMA City Development Agency, Cloud Borna, Vice Dean for Education and Academic Affairs, and Senior Lecturer at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, Chido Nwankor, with Director of the African Center for Cities at the University of Cape Town, Edgar Patirsa. Good morning, everyone. What a pleasure to be here and to bring the African story into this very important conversation this morning. In the green room, I had a discussion with one of the mayors this morning, and it was clear that he was a little bit taken aback that we're using the term the African century. Why could that possibly be? What makes this so significant? So I ask of you to think of this. By 2060, Africa will have the largest labor force in the world bigger than China, bigger than India. And at the moment, none of the global education policies is anticipating that. Second fact, we know that it is impossible to address the climate crisis unless we appreciate that today as we sit here, the Congo Basin accounts for more carbon sinks than the Amazon. And yet it is not in the global discussion. I can go on. If we look, for example, at the fact that the highest rate of digital financial transactions is in Africa, it tells you that there's a hunger and appetite to embrace the digital revolution. And yet, if we look at global policy, if we look at geopolitics, we look at trade policy, Africa is not at the table. It is not recognized as critical. And at the heart of this emergence of this continent is not just its young people, but it is urbanization, it's the role of cities. What we will see is in just the next 25 years is a more than doubling of the urban residents from, from 580, 90 million today to 1.4 billion by 2050 when we should have achieved the Paris Climate Agreement. And as we sit, not our Pan-African institutions, not the global agencies, not national governments, no one is paying attention to what is required to address this question. So today we will reflect with two incredible minds from the continent about what do we do with African cities? What is the role of leadership? What is the role of innovation? And how do we shift 
the political climate. And so, Chida, I want to ask you first to help us get the macro picture clear, to understand how do we ensure that there's common purpose across the African continent in the first instance, and then globally, to really understand the profound nature of the transition and how to optimize the urban opportunity? Thank you, Edgar. Hello. <laughs> um, and so I imagine that by common purpose, um, your, it's another way of framing the African century, mm -hmm. um, which essentially um, crystallizes the idea that um, Africa, Africa's position and significance in the global stage is changing. Right, so um, essentially that this is anchored in um, Africa's resources, right? Natural resources, um, rare earth minerals. Um, Africa has 80% of the world's uh, platinum deposits, 50% of the world's um, copper deposits, 40% of the world's manganese deposits, and huge amounts of lithium and other rare earth minerals. Um, it's anchored in the fact that Africa's waterways will be significant um, going forward for global trade. The forests, Amazon, like you talked about. Um, it's also anchored in the fact that Africa has a huge growing middle, um, uh, uh, mid middle class, right? Uh, but perhaps I think this all is um, centered on Africa's, what I think we all consider Africa's greatest advantage, which is, which is this um, demographic shift, mm -hmm. right? Um, currently, Africa has 1.4 billion people. By the end of the century, Africa will have 3.9 billion people, greater than India, greater than China. Um, but as you rightly pointed out, right, Narratives around this advantage mm -hmm. often um, unfold along parochial lines, along alarmist lines. Oh, Africa is following the world, right? Um, but really not taking into consideration the fact that Africa is going to be significant for global survival, mm -hmm. food production, mm -hmm. right? Because 65% uh, of uncultivated arable land reside in Africa. Yeah. For example, Germany's um, median age is 49 years. Mm -hmm. In Africa, is 19. Yeah. And so when the global population is aging, Africa's population is going yonder. And we know that we're talking about innovation, and we're talking about um, rejuvenation, and we're talking about um, you know, technological advancements. We're essentially talking about youth. No offense to those of us in the, world, in the room that are kind of, <laughs> but this is the reality. And Africa has an abundance of that. Mm -hmm. So essentially then we're talking about the common purpose. What we're, we're looking at is how does Africa harness yep. this huge potential, right? Which means that there has to be a common understanding among African leaders of what this means, mm -hmm. of Africa's position in the world. Right? And then to leverage these resources and leverage this um, huge existing inter um, economic and intra domestic um, potentials, mm -hmm. right? To drive and to be sure that Africa's position in the world is, in fact, where it should be and not yeah. where the narratives place it. Yeah. And these different narratives we're talking about, the, 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 the nodal point where we can harness all of these opportunity are indeed the urban areas where the best talent migrate to and where there's the greatest concentration of economic opportunity. Now, one of our challenges are that we don't have a lot of examples of the kind of institutional innovation that's required on the ground to optimize these opportunities. So, Claude, you are leading one of the most important test beds, sites of experimentation on the continent, in a country called Benin, uh, at the edges of a city called Cotonou. 
And you are, if you will, um, providing a leadership role and an R&D function for the whole continent to help us understand the kinds of institutions we need to build to optimize this youthful demographic. Could you share with us the journey of Semi City, what this intervention is, and what might be the lessons for the rest of the continent? Thank you, Edgar, and uh, delighted to be here and talk about Semi City. So Semi City is an initiative of the Beninese government. Um, I don't know how many of you in the room know where Benin is. Um, Oh, I see one hand raised. <laughs> so Benin is, uh, is in West Africa. Uh, it's a country of uh, 13 million. Um, and really what we're betting on is um, knowledge economy. Uh, I heard this morning that knowledge is a great equalizer. And when we're talking about that demographic boom, um, what we want to ensure is that we have youth that can contribute to the development of their country, of their continent. And this is what Semi City is. We rely on three pillars. So new ways of educating, higher education in areas that are going to be future-proof. Uh, I'm talking about, of course, um, technology and science. We need more engineers. But we also need more animators. We need people who understand AI, who are comfortable with the, the, the technology and, and who can provide solutions using technologies that is becoming readily available for us. We need research done on the, in the continent by African based on our agenda. We also need entrepreneurs who wake up in the morning with the, the change-making mindset. They want to create jobs for themselves. They want to create jobs for others. And they need help. And this is what Semi City is. This is putting together these three pillars and giving them a place to really thrive, to make partnerships with people who have done that before but are thinking about how that, that apply in our African context. This is what Semi City is. We started in 2017. We have a number of programs that are already underway. And now we're moving to our scaling phase developing our city, with, which will be able to accommodate 30,000 more young people wanting to change the world. Thank you. And what for me is so striking about Semi City is that you're trying to identify the potential for innovation across the entire value chain, from the human capital side to the pedagogic project to the application with startup companies, but also to try and embed bio-based construction materials and sustainable design in the actual campus itself. And this is really to make the point that innovation in the African context is really about taking global best practice, but recognizing the importance of embedding that in a very unique local context that has been riddled with a history of neglect and underinvestment, but that also has incredible indigenous knowledge systems that can help us produce genuine, grounded innovation. But within that, there are important cultural barriers as well. And I would say one of those would be an underappreciation of the centrality of women's empowerment and, and particularly gender transformation in terms of leadership development and so forth. Of course, we've got a fantastic example of a woman leader in the case of Semi City, but I wonder, Chido, if you maybe, because you're a scholar of leadership and of gender equality, if you could maybe share with us your perspective on why gender equality is so important in thinking about the African project. Um, thank you. So, I, 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 the, the evidence is monumental, right? That women's um, inclusion and not just inclusion, right? We're gonna let you come in, right? And we're gonna let you operate based on existing um, laws and norms and regimes that have kept you out yeah. all this while, right? So women's meaningful inclusion, right? Um, actually is the basis uh, for, if we look ac across, is a driver of economic growth. Um, and so when we're talking about leadership, women's leadership, we look across the cities um, in Africa, for example, uh, the megalopolis, right? Uh, the 
the 600 miles of coastal city from Abidjan to Lagos, right? Um, and particularly in Lagos, right, which uh, by 2035 will have 25 million people, yeah. right? And um, most of them, half of the, them being women and girls. And we look at the increasing um, impact of women in the economy, even though they are marginalized mm -hmm. and they operate in the informal sector, what we call the informal sector, but what we know actually underwrites the formal sector, yeah. right? Yeah. Go figure, right? <laughs> um, if we look at the impact of that, we look at the impact of um, women's um, work, right? Uh, in unpaid care work in, in carrying the weight of the country, uh, the economic weight of the country. Uh, if we look at all of this, it becomes really clear that training women as leaders, women are marginalized and they are this powerful, right? Uh, which also uh, harkens to this idea of women's empowerment, mm -hmm. which is an, a disempowering narrative that folks have used for a while, right? Uh, that's that women are not powerful, inherently powerful, you know, men are... Women are inherently powerful. In fact, maybe a little bit more powerful than men, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> the difference here is in, in, in access, right? Um, the, the creation of opportunity mm -hmm. um, and letting women breathe, have a little bit of time to think, to be creative, right? Rather than tasks all yeah. through day, right? So, we create opportunities um, and we expand access for women's leadership. Mm -hmm. COVID-19 showed us that. These headwinds of economic depression show us that. The solutions, indigenous solutions that actually work for the climate crisis show us that, right? So I think it's high time policymakers, uh, those of you in the room, right, actually wake up to the fact that um, we exclude women from powerful policy making spaces to the continuing detriment of the globe, of the global force, right? So let's kind of get it together and get women in the room and actually let them talk, right? So Chido, uh, allow me to do a small shout out uh, for the support Bloomberg Philanthropy is providing for a program called the African Merrill Leadership Initiative. And in the first cohort, uh, we've got some amazing women leaders uh, ac from across the continent. Some of them are at the conference and they'll speak at some sessions today. Uh, but just to underscore exactly all the points that you've made, and I've seen that directly in that experience. We're running low on time, so I just want to give uh, Claude a, a final word. And I guess, Claude, we know innovation is the central narrative of how we can harness Africa's unique capabilities and assets, but also proactively respond to the formidable challenges. As one of Africa's leading innovators and institution builders, uh, what gets you up in the morning? What keeps you hopeful? Why do you continue to do this really difficult work? <laughs> um, I think it's seeing the impact. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if it's the case around the world, but in, in Africa, in Benin, you see the impact very quickly. You start with young ones, uh, you see them a year later, and you see what they've done. Actually, this morning I woke up to a message sent by someone in my team saying, hey, my project, to use artificial intelligence for waste water treatment has been approved. This right. is the sort of things that you see when you're in Africa. And I think this is what keeps us going because we know that the time here is critical. It's not easy. There are a lot of challenges. There are a lot of struggles. But in the struggles lies opportunity. And, and I think that mindset that young Africans have that is like the world is their oyster. I, I think, yes, we're growing in numbers, but in that gives a pool of more and more talent that you're gonna hear about. You don't know about Benin today, but you will know about Benin tomorrow because you will hear about these great things that are coming out of what's happening there. And I think um, the other important message that I wanna share here, it's, it's a global village, it takes you know, yes, an agency like ours, but it also takes government, it takes community leaders, it takes academia, 
it, that, that's willing to transform itself. And it takes philanthropy to make it happen. Thank you, Claude. So for a moment there, you know, as an academic, I felt vindicated. And then, of course, she added, uh, <laughs> willing to transform. So message well, well received. And on the continent, I can assure you, we're all busy with the work of innovation and transformation because we understand our responsibility is not just to our citizens, but it is to the global community. Thank you so much, and thank you both of you. Thank you. And now, the governor of Maryland, Wes Moore, in conversation with opinion columnist for The Washington Post, Jonathan Capehart. Hey guys. Wow, the clock is already ticking down, Governor, <laughs> governor Moore of the great state of Maryland. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you are an intern in right. Baltimore uh, Mayor Kurt Schmoke's uh, office. What did you learn while you were there? What did you do? What did you learn? And how are you using that knowledge in your position as governor? <laughs> uh, what I learned is, uh, first thing a lot of interns learn is like, where's the coffee machine? And, and, uh, and, and where, do you, where do you pick things up for folks? Um, but I, I tell you, it was also, it was really great for me because um, it was my first time getting a chance to see city government and seeing how it works, how it doesn't, mm -hmm. uh, to see the, the, the broad ambitions, but, but oftentimes the, uh, the extraordinary limitations if you don't have the right partnerships that are established in place. Um, but also I think one of the biggest things that I learned and I got from that experience was um, you know, I, I found a mentor who has been a guide and a friend for not just my entire professional career, uh, but for my entire life, where literally I don't think there's a single major decision that I have made uh, that I have not called up Mayor Schmoke mm -hmm. and gotten his thoughts and gotten his advice on it. So, um, so you know, I got a lot of professional things out of, out of it, but really what I got out of it was, was a, a personal connection that is going to last a lifetime. But in terms, of, in terms of policy, now I know you're a governor, there are lots of mayors uh, in here, but how are you using that knowledge to to help localities in your state? Of course, I'm thinking of, of Baltimore, but yeah. how are you applying that knowledge? Well, you know, I, I think the you know I I ran for office having never run for office before in my life. Um, I know it's kind of odd if you're like you're a governor, you've never literally run for office before. I mean, we've um, seen that happen. It, we've seen it happen. <laughs> you, you, I'm hoping mine's going to turn out a little better. Uh, um, <laughs> but you know, I work. I mean, I worked for someone who ran for uh, who ran for mayor who had not run for elected no. office before, and he was wildly successful. Yes, Mayor and, Bloomberg. No, that's right. <laughs> Just to put a that's final right. point on it. That's right. But go on. I interrupt. No, but you know, but I, I think um, you know when I draw back from the lessons that I've taken, where you know it was, it's my first time being in elected office. It's not my first time being a chief executive. It's not my first time running large organizations. Uh, you know, I've, I've led soldiers in combat. I've led a, a successful start of business. I have, I have, uh, I've also led one of the largest poverty fighting organizations in this country. And honestly, a lot of those lessons that I took from those experiences were great preparation for what I'm now doing as a chief executive of, of the state. I, I take a look at the, uh, you know, the work that we did over in Robin Hood, where really exclusively what we focused on was find it, fund it, and scale it, right? A pretty simple equation. Find what works, make sure it's getting the resources that it needs, and then make sure it can touch more people than it can touch when you first initially found it, right? And in many ways, being a governor is very simple, and it's very similar, where you are working in partnership with your local jurisdictions. It is true, the people, the, you know, as, as I said, you know, the people who are closest to the challenges are the ones who are closest to the solutions, they're just hardly ever at the table. Right? So if you can come up with a new frame for the way the state government works that can actually be close to the people, identify the things that, that are working, because the solutions are there, they just oftentimes don't get the shine. And then making sure that you're being smart and diligent and thoughtful about how state resources can then use those type of things that are working and scale and touch more people. And so in many ways, the, uh, the, the foundation that I had 
uh, when I decided to run for governor, I, uh, you know, even though, even though I, I'm actually learning on, on the, you know, as the days go by, was probably the best preparation I could have gotten to be the, the, the 63rd governor for the state of Maryland. So given all of that, everything that you just said, you realize I'm trying to get you to tell everyone here what you were telling me backstage yeah. about an initiative that is, has either just started, yes. is about to start. Could you please help a brother out? Absolutely. And, and tell, tell them, because this is, this is a, very, a very interesting and innovative uh, plan that you have. It's exciting. And, it, and it's going to be the first time uh, that we've seen in our nation's history that a state is actually going to take on this type of initiative. And really what the focus is, is we're going to have a state-led initiative that is going to be a place-based investment strategy. And what we mean by that essentially is this. I, I don't understand how we were looking at our budget. And if you look at the balance sheet, the balance sheet not only does not, the balance sheet does not reflect our ambitions. But the other thing is the balance sheet does not reflect realities. And what I mean by that is you have this almost like peanut butter politics thing that happens with state balance sheets, where it's like everybody's going to get a little bit, and everybody gets this, and everybody gets that. The problem is that's not how things show themselves in neighborhoods. That's not how things show themselves in communities. And you have to be able to follow the data. You know, and I say as a leader, I am data-driven and heart-led. Right? I wear my heart on my sleeve, and I acknowledge that. But I don't move without data. And the data in the state of Maryland is very clear about what are the most challenged neighborhoods, the most challenged communities that we have in our state. Right? Urban, rural, and suburban. Follow the data. And so what we're going to be, uh, what we're going to be uh, doing in partnership with, uh, with our you know, philanthropic partners, in partnership with our local jurisdictions and our mayors and our county executives, in partnership with the private sector, is basically saying, take a look at the most challenged census tract zip code areas, and then what would it look like if you flooded those with resources? What would it look like if you actually took those neighborhoods that have been chronically and historically neglected and said, we're actually going to prioritize them unapologetically about everything, the way we look at transportation assets, the way we look at housing, the way we look at food security, the way we look at educational systems and schools. If you could take a look at all the way we look at, at economic advancement and incentivizing jobs and employment inside those areas, what would it look like if you could prioritize the places that have been underprioritized? And so that's something that Maryland is going to be, uh, that we're excited about, that we're going to be leaning on, uh, that we're going to be announcing some stuff very soon. And, uh, and we're just looking forward to working in partnership with, with all of you to make it happen. So the policy wonk in me is like, all right, this, this sounds smart. It sounds great. But then the political uh, wonk in me is like, how are you going to deal with the political pushback from the Jiffy Caucus. So you were talking about <laughs> peanut butter politics. Well, there are a lot of people out there who, who like, they like the peanut butter aspect of public policy. So yeah. how, and you said you're gonna do this unapologetically. Yeah. So what's your, what's your response to why are you giving it to them? What about us? We've got problems too. I, I think you have to be, if, if we lead with data, we're gonna come up with the right conclusions. And, and, and that's really what we're going to show people is that, you know, A, this is not emotive, right? We're not saying this because it sounds good. We're just following the data. And the data is very clear that we are going to put an inordinate amount of resources healing instead of putting those resources towards building. And that cannot be the way that we focus our budget, and it cannot be the way that we have our politics work. And I think the other big thing that we're, we're going to be doing, and this is frankly something uh, that's worked so far in our first 10 months. You know, we, we introduced 10 bills into our first legislative session. Not only did we go 10 for 10 on all the bills that we introduced, and that included things like raising a minimum, a minimum wage of $15, making permanent child tax credit, uh, having an enhanced earned income tax credit. Maryland's now the first state in this country that has a service year option for all of our high school graduates. Maryland's now the first state in the country that gives, uh, that gives a pathway for both dental and health care for all members of the National Guard. I mean, we got some very big things done. We went 10 for 10, but we went 10 for 10 bipartisan. We got Democrat and Republican votes on every single one of the initiatives that we pushed. And the big thing that we did was, we just went directly to the people. Have them make your case for you. Because we knew that when we came on board, again, you know, I, I, and one of the nice things about not being in politics, you know, we were not the establishment choice. Right? We weren't the person that was tapped by someone to say, you should run for governor. 
In fact, I had more people come to saying you should not run for governor. <laughs> um, but what we just decided to do then is say, we just made our case to the people. And we ended up winning with more individual votes than anyone who's ever run for governor in the history of the state of Maryland. And so that's just the way we're planning on governing, where we're going to work in partnership with all of our partners and the Jiffy Caucus. <laughs> I like that. And to make sure that everyone knows they're going to be seen and they're going to be heard. Yet at the same time, we're going to follow the data. We're going to go where the data leads us. And we're going to go directly to the people and have them be your advocates. In, in your answer, you talked about transportation. And I understand the red line in, in Baltimore is very important to you. Yes. Uh, talk about the red line and, and its importance. So I mean, the, you cannot have economic mobility if you don't have physical mobility, period. All right, you, could, you could place all the job placement things all you want, but if it takes you an hour and a half to go a mile and a half because of a lack of public transportation, transportation assets, then what have you done and what have you created? Uh, we had plans that had gone on for a decade to create a red line. Uh, which is basically the first time that you would have east-west transit taking place within the city of Baltimore and the Baltimore region. My predecessor decided that, um, that the money should be returned to the federal government uh, as if we didn't need it. And I'm still wondering, like, who was the we? Because we really could have used that, that capital. Um, and so one of the first things that we did when we came on board, I said, you know, uh, respectfully, we're putting it back on track. And so we prioritize making sure that the red line is going to be built and the red line will be built in our time. And we're going to be working, and we'll be working in partnership with the federal government. And again, I want to give a, a, a big shout out to, uh, to the Biden administration, because I want to be clear. Uh, when we talk about what we're doing with the red line, if you don't have a bipartisan infrastructure act, if you don't have the kind of partnerships that we have in Washington, all these things sound like great ideas, but become very complicated to make happen. And so we've got an extraordinary partner inside the White House right now. Um, and the thing that is now going to happen is it's not, not just going to be something that's going to increase physical mobility. It's going to be an economically sound way of actually increasing transportation assets because we have to be able to focus on making sure we're getting cars off of the road and coming up with more mass transit options for people to be able to pursue and to be able to take advantage of. But in addition to that, it creates this measurement of closeness and allows us to start doing the transit-oriented transit -oriented development and investments that are going to be necessary for us to really push forward into the future. Um, as is your way. We've got 35 seconds left. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to go rogue, and I'm going to ask you one more question, and we're going to go a little bit over time. Okay. One of the things you were most proud of when you ran for governor was that you went everywhere yeah. in the state. You went to, quote unquote, red districts, red counties, and, and blue counties yeah. with, with the same message. For, for the urbanites in the room, um, what have you learned from talking to folks in rural communities, what, what should the urbanites in the room know about rural communities? That's a good question. I, um, you know, I, I remember when, one, in fact, the first visit that I took as governor was to a place called Lonaconi uh, over in Western Maryland. And they were having a, uh, a, a water crisis, so they were having a bull water advisory, so, uh, so I went out there to go spend some time in the community. And I remember the mayor, a guy named uh, Mayor Coburn, who I've become pretty close friends with. Uh, he, he said to me, he said, Governor, do me a favor. Turn 360 degrees. So I turned 360 degrees. He said, the only guarantee I can make you is you didn't see a Democrat in five miles of anywhere you just <laughs> <laughs> he said. He said, but I tell you what, he said, you're the first governor that's been here since 1996. 96. Um, the thing that I think uh, people want more than anything else is they just want to be seen. They just want to feel like you're willing to show up, right? And, and, and now, and, and it's interesting because I know that with all of my colleagues in the legislature, both Democrat and Republican, they know. You know, I, you know I'm, 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 we will talk and listen to anybody. We're not going to agree on everything. That's fine. But the only thing that I ask is that if we disagree on a Monday, can we come back on a Tuesday and figure out if there's something else we can work on? It's the only ask I have, right? And, and I think the thing that uh, oftentimes there's this idea of a, of, a, of a frustration that people have about rural communities. And you know, they're uh, you know, just disconnected. Um, but actually, a lot of their frustration about not being seen is valid. And it's true. When you have a fact that a governor hasn't shown up in Lona Koning since 1996, 
Mayor Coburn's frustration is valid. So I think that if we're just willing to show up and we're willing to plead our case and we're willing to hear theirs, I think we're going to come to a place where we can have a much greater level of not just understanding, but a much greater level of progress where the progress can be universally felt and where it doesn't feel like if this group gets this, then that means by definition this group loses. And I think if we can make that argument, the same way we're making the argument where I'm going out to Western Maryland, going out to Eastern Shore, talking about why we're investing in Baltimore. And you got to make that argument. But explain to them that, guys, this is not a zero-sum game we're playing in right now. And in fact, the only zero-sum outcome is if we keep on playing around with this idea that in order to win, it means by definition some must lose, and that means lose repeatedly. We can address that. I think we're going to have a much better, uh, much better conclusion. Um, you are the first black governor of Maryland. You are the third black governor in the history of the United States. You are the 63rd governor of Maryland. You are Governor Wes Moore. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Josh. Thank you. Thanks, guys.